Club. Welcome to another timely and, I think, important City Club Friday Forum, this time on the subject of emergency preparedness. Our special guests today are Mara Thompson-Lee, Director of Oregon's Office of Emergency Management, Dr. Grant Higginson, Public Health Officer for Oregon Health Division, and Major Greg Williford, who is Director of Operations Services for the Oregon State Police. But first, some announcements. We're delighted to welcome new member Ted Coonfield, who's on the Board of Governors of Kitty Hawk Airlines. Are you here, Ted? Welcome, in any case. <laughs> Incidentally, there will be a new member orientation immediately following this luncheon in the room overlooking the stadium next door for anyone who has joined in the last few months. Join us next week on Friday, November the 2nd, for the first major public address by the new director of the Port of Portland, Bill Wyatt. He's taken on the considerable challenges of this position at a very tough time. Besides concerns for national and local safety, the airline industry, as you know, is in a state of turmoil. So those are just some of the problems he will have to address. So I hope you'll plan to be here for Mr. Wyatt's presentation on the state of the Port of Portland, and that'll be here at the MAC. <coughs> You've each received a pledge card and a letter from me asking you to participate generously in this year's annual fund campaign. Thanks to the generosity of our corporate friends and many individuals, we've already passed the 67,000 mark in our $95,000 campaign. Now it's mostly down to personal contributions from members to reach our target and assure continued flow of the research papers and the programs that have distinguished the City Club's contribution to Portland and the state for the past 85 years. If you haven't looked at our website recently, you might do so now because it's just been completely redesigned and it looks terrific. www.pdxcityclub.org through it, you can now join the club, make luncheon reservations, and of course, hear Friday programs online. Last week, we began inviting you to wear name tags at Friday forums. This will make it easier for new members and those of us with fallible memories to engage one another in conversation. If you have questions about the club, you can now identify board and staff members by their plastic name tags, so go and ask them. Our member host today is Colleen Craft, found the table here, who is a member of the Board of Governors and she's chair of the program committee. She will ask the first question of our guests. Following Colleen's question, we'll open the program to questions from City Club members in the audience. As usual, please um, be ready at the microphone before Colleen has finished our question so we can make the most of our guests' speaking time. Uh, identify yourself as a member of the City Club and ask your question briefly, please. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Legacy Health Systems, Pope and Talbot Incorporated, and Washington Mutual Savings Bank. We are most grateful for their support. Today, we're fortunate to have with us three members of the Oregon Domestic Preparedness Advisory Team. Our guests will discuss overall disaster coordination, the role of law enforcement in evaluating threats of bioterrorism, and the intended response of the public health system to such disasters. Do Dr. Grant Higginson grew up in Portland and was educated at Oregon State and at OHSU. After an internship in Wil Wilmington, Delaware, he worked for three years as a GP with Native American populations in South Dakota and Nebraska. He quickly recognized that much of his effort was devoted to avoidable disease and injury, and so he returned to school at Columbia to study public health and to practice preventative medicine in New York. Fourteen years ago, Dr. Higginson returned to Portland, and since 1994, he's been the state health officer. So public disaster preparedness is just one of the many public health responsibilities that he carries. Major Gregory Williford is responsible for overseeing all field and special operations within the Department of State Police. Next week, he will be appointed director of the newly formed Office of Public Safety and Security, where his primary purpose will be to coordinate anti-terrorism and domestic preparedness efforts, working with both state and national agencies. Major Williford is a native Oregonian who's worked in most departments of the State Police Department in the last 22 years, He's a graduate of PSU and a more recent graduate of the FBI National Academy. 
Myra Lee, also of the Poli uh, State Police Department, has served as Director of Oregon Emergency Management Division since 1987. For 14 years before that, she held a similar role with Multnomah County. She's held and continues to hold leadership roles in an impressive number of national emergency-related organizations, including current work on the Terrorism Task Force of the National Emergency Management Association. After attending the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard in 1996, Ms. Lee took part in an exchange with Russia's Far East Territory Emergency Management Program as the governor's representative. So we have a spectrum of experience on our panel, which is both broad and deep. To initiate the discussion, I'm going to ask Dr. Higginson to begin. Please welcome our panel. Thank, thank you very much, and, and good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today. And, and as you can see, we have a three-way tag team presentation for you this afternoon. And I'm going to start off with some, some very brief, brief remarks. What we're talking about today is domestic preparedness, and that is our ability to respond to weapons of mass destruction. And here we're not only talking about bioterrorism, which has been in the news so much over the last couple of weeks, but also weapons that could use radiological, agents, chemical agents, and even uh, conventional weapons. There is a national framework that we're using when we're dealing with, with weapons of mass destruction. The, the first component of that framework is threat. We need to identify the potential for terrorist action and prevent such action. We need to know who the bad guys are, what they're capable of doing, what they're thinking of doing, and then prevent them from doing it. And the responsibility for a threat in doing that is with law enforcement. And so the first person that's really going to provide information today is uh, Major Greg Williford. The second component of domestic preparedness is response capacity. Whether it's a man-made disaster or a natural disaster, anything that is a major event is going to require a lot of coordination of a vast array of resources and often will also require us to look for additional resources as well. The agency that's responsible for providing that overall coordination is the Oregon Office of Emergency Management, and so the second person to talk will be Myra Thompson Lee. And then what I'm going to finish up with is the public health side of things. With, with any kind of major, uh, major event, we would be responsible for trying to coordinate the overall health response. And then in addition to that, in the case of bioterrorist events, we have some very specific responsibilities. And uh, because of what's been happening over the last few weeks, that's where I'm going to focus most of my remarks. Before I hand it over to Greg, I also wanted to mention, though, that having all three of these co uh, components coordinated and working together is something that is very important. So actually over the last year and a half, Myra, Greg, and I have been co-chairing a policy group that meets about every other month just to make sure that, that our agencies are working together and that we continue to work with key stakeholders. Also, the governor over the last few weeks has convened a security council that is advising him on anti-terrorist activities and we're involved in those efforts as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Greg. Thank you, uh, Dr. Higginson, and uh, good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, talk to you about uh, law enforcement's role in the area of uh, domestic preparedness and counterterrorism. Uh, the, the, I, I want to start off, I guess, before I get into the real meat of my uh, information, uh, is that just to reemphasize that um, this is really a uh, collective uh, collaboration that's been ongoing for a long time in Oregon. Uh, we're fortunate that we have uh, uh, good leadership in this state at various levels of government, uh, state, uh, federal, county and city uh, levels with first responders, emergency management, and fire and police in doing all hazards planning and uh, domestic terrorism fits in those uh, emergency operations planning and training and exercises. And uh, we uh, certainly after September 11th are re-examining those at all layers uh, and levels within the state of Oregon and uh, shoring them up where they need to be and looking at our vulnerabilities and moving forward. But we, uh, this is not new, and uh, we have been uh, collaborating for some time on all hazards approach to, to disaster. And uh, now we're just going to be looking at that which is man-made uh, and not natural. So the um, primary role of law enforcement in, 
counterterrorism and response to uh, weapons of mass destruction really has three primary components uh, in collaboration with uh, a lot of different entities, and that is prevention, it is effective response to an incident if it does occur, and then to have an effective, immediate, and intense investigation that occurs if an event were to occur. And um, the uh, first one, uh, relative to uh, law enforcement's role in prevention, really deals with uh, having uh, effective uh, risk analysis and threat analysis done on potential vulnerabilities that may exist in uh, your city, county, or in the state of Oregon. And through a lot of different processes, you look at those uh, vulnerabilities and you develop effective emergency uh, response plans and training scenarios that will hopefully mitigate and uh, help you to uh, effectively respond to if you end up having an event. But uh, more importantly, hopefully you have a uh, good investigative component. You've got good communication uh, with those uh, uh, in the intelligence uh, circles to prevent a response, a event happening in the first place. So criminal intelligence operations at different layers are certainly uh, a, necess a necessity to effectively uh, monitor uh, criminal groups or those that are uh, criminally uh, believed to be involved in uh, terrorism activities or planning. So. Intelligence operations involve a very cooperative effort. They involve uh, exchange of information at different layers of, of uh, authority and government uh, to be most effective. Those also certainly go right along with doing threat analysis and threat assessments with various groups that are identified within the criminal intelligence circles to uh, try to event or prevent a uh, event from happening in the first place. If we end up having a event uh, occur in the state, um, then of course having an effective and immediate response that is well coordinated among first responders uh, is critical. And that's where a lot of the training and the exercises and planning that has been taking place for well over the last year and a half at different layers uh, and in different communities is uh, very, very uh, helpful and useful. And one thing that we, of course, start off with uh, is to make sure that emergency uh, 911 centers and other um, communications entities uh, have uh, training and recognition of how to recognize signs of a, uh, if it's a biochem event or if it was some t form of terrorism, that they can recognize those signs as early as possible so that when they dispatch emergency responders, first responders to an event, that they are able to uh, provide them with appropriate information so they can do that response as uh, safely and effectively as possible. Another area in the area of response, of course, is that it uh, needs to be very well coordinated and it's not just one uh, agency. There's police fire, there's local emergency management, depending on the type of event. But in general terms, it needs to be very coordinated and it needs to be multi-layered and it needs to be tested. And that's, again, part of the planning that, that we do. Some of the other elements that you do on a first response, in addition to getting your people there safely and immediately, is to uh, set up, of course, a very solid and uh, uh, do a scene assessment at first and set up a, a strong perimeter to keep uh, the event from uh, causing further harm, or if it's a biochem event, to can prevent uh, further contamination or exposure, and then to allow further uh, commanders to get there and as soon as possible to establish a unified uh, law enforcement emergency uh, command that would start uh, further uh, managing and administering the response. And the third piece that I mentioned is um, investigation, that if we end up with a uh, terrorism event in the state of Oregon, of course, a, an effective investigation, an intense investigation is critical. And again, that involves multiple layers, but the um, Federal Bureau of Investigation would be the agency that would uh, most likely be uh, the primary agency if it's a domestic uh, terrorism uh, event that is uh, the subject of a criminal investigation, and they would be working with the law enforcement agency that has primary jurisdiction wherever this event may have occurred. So it would be a very uh, strong collaboration, uh, more likely to be led by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and certainly worked uh, jointly with other law enforcement entities 
uh, both at the federal level and at the uh, state level and certainly at the level in the local jurisdiction and wherever it happened to occur. Uh, those investigations are very focused, they're very intense, and uh, I mean the largest one in history is going on right now. And um, there oftentimes, if it's a, an incident of terrorism, it's going to be international uh, with the potential of being uh, worldwide in, in scope. That's a real brief thumbnail. I look forward to having uh, any questions you may have when it, uh, we do the Q&A portion. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over, though, as far as we talk about the response capacity if we have an event and uh, mitigation with uh, my relief from Oregon Emergency Management. Mara. Thank you. Um, I, too, really appreciate the opportunity to be here with um, my colleagues and uh, talk about this important topic. What I wanted to do today is uh, discuss just very briefly how the emergency management system works in Oregon. Emergency management is a division of state police. We are the, the counterpart agency to the fe Federal Emergency Management Agency, so we do many of the same types of things that they do. And our purpose is to coordinate the emergency services system statewide. The system itself, if you look at it as a total system, involves uh, the local and state emergency response and emergency service agencies, as well as the emergency management offices at um, the county and the state level. And we also have several cities that are involved in our emergency management program, Portland being one of those. The state response priorities uh, for any kind of an emergency or disaster are for saving lives, protecting health and safety, and protecting the environment. And those are things that we all take very seriously. The responsibilities of my office are to coordinate the development of a state plan. We don't write the plan, but we do coordinate among all the state agencies uh, for the development of a, a state plan in which all the pieces fit together. and. What we tend to call a basic plan is identifies the functions of all functions and responsibilities of all the state agencies when we have an emergency or a disaster. And then the, each of those state agencies also have supporting plans uh, that address particular types of hazards. We provide assistance and funding for the local programs. The funding that goes to local government comes from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and it helps to fund the, the planning uh, and the training that occurs at the local level. We manage the State Emergency Coordination Center during uh, an event, and that is a facility that has uh, the capacity for having representatives from all of the state agencies, as well as some local and federal agencies. And that is a team of people who are there to um, provide advice to the governor and to also act as liaison between their departments and the center itself so all the activities can be coordinated. We facilitate uh, the management of information from the local state, uh, from the local level to state agencies and to the federal agencies. This is done on a 24-hour basis. We have what uh, have implemented many years ago what is called the Oregon Emergency Response System. It's a 24-hour service that uh, is not generally a service that the public calls, but it is a service that uh, local government calls to let us know what is what kind of an event is occurring, and then we uh, notify all of the state agencies that need to know about that event and and or need to respond to that event. So it is again. Um, uh, function of coordination. Our office is also responsible for the implementation of statewide enhanced 911, and we coordinate with the uh, sheriffs of all the counties on search and rescue. So our activities are really fairly diverse in the kinds of things that we do. We operate under ORS, Oregon Revised Statute 401. And in that, it defines uh, what the state response will be for a disaster. And that the state response occurs when an appropriate response is beyond the capability of the city or the county. A city or county fails to act, or an emergency involves two or more counties, like the 1996 floods. 
we were very involved with that. The general process is that local government responds. If they need assistance, state assistance of any kind, they call us and we start that coordination process. If it gets considerably beyond what they are able to do and they need quite a few state resources, they will request a disaster declaration and the governor will uh, make a proclamation of a declaration. In the event that it goes uh, another step higher where we need federal assistance, then our office prepares the governor's request to the president and uh, the process goes through FEMA, the declaration occurs, and federal resources are made available to the state. Uh, in long-term recovery, such as the 1996 floods, uh, we manage the recovery activities that occur. And in that, we had um, over 3,000 projects that we managed uh, for about $98 million worth of activities. The uh, State Emergency Coordination Center is activated sometimes for something that is relatively minor and, of course, other times for things that are much more ma major. We may only have a few people in there at a time or we may have representatives from up to 22 agencies. We, uh, in that capacity, and in most of the things we do, we're more like the oil in an engine where you can't see us, but we try to make things run smoother. And that's what we try to do with, with all of our activities, both in planning and training and in emergency operations. The operations that occur are actually directed from each of the agencies involved, such as the state police, uh, state fire marshal, the, the health division. All of those agencies will direct all of the operations that are uh, occurring in coordination with local government. But we coordinate the liaison in one locality. We also serve as the liaison with FEMA and with other federal agencies in order to get the appropriate um, response to the local and state agencies that need it. One of the things that we do um, and we have found to be very beneficial is that when a, an emergency occurs, our staff also serves as liaison point and we will have one person uh, that is the contact for each of the counties or the cities involved. And that way we make sure that any time a major event occurs, we have somebody who is paying direct attention to what that community needs. Uh, we found that to be very beneficial both for them and for us. We oftentimes are um, asked the question, what do you do when you don't have a disaster? Well, we do a lot of planning. We do a lot of coordination of planning. Uh, we have a very extensive training program uh, where we provide training for uh, police and fire and emergency management personnel, public works and uh, health personnel, engineers. So we have a very diverse training program. And that, uh, that goes on all year long. These kinds of things are all directed at what we call an all hazards approach. There are basic kinds of functions that you do for any type of situation that occurs. And we all practice those and we know those very well. Uh, when a particular type of event occurs, then we deal with the characteristics of that event. And the agency that has the primary responsibility for it, excuse me, <coughs> such as a terrorist act, is going to be the law enforcement agencies. They are the lead agency for that, and we are supporting them in that activity. So if it were um, um, a health, a bioterrorism type of event, then our lead agency is going to be uh, through the public health officer. As was indicated already, a lot of the things that um, are in the headlines now, we've been working on for a uh, a year and a half. In the last six months, we have been coordinating a needs assessment statewide uh, where the local governments actually do a self-assessment of both the risk that they consider they have from a terrorist event as well as their capability to re respond to that. And the purpose is to identify those kinds of things that they need uh, that they don't already have in order to respond to an event. 
We are in the final stages of that assessment. We hope to have it finished pretty much in the next two or three weeks. And then we will go on to the next stage, which is the strategic planning uh, stage. We will develop a coordinated strategic plan statewide, and this will be in partnership, as, have, as has already been indicated. And um, from that, we hope to have a long, uh, long-range view of how we will respond to all of these things. The events of September 11th have certainly kicked that into high gear, and we are all uh, making that a priority, and it comes above everything else at this point in time. So um, I, I think the thing that I am most comfortable with in the state of Oregon is that we have, um, we have a system that works well together. We have uh, good communication and coordination with local government. And we also have, I think, some of the best coordination among state agencies that occurs in this nation. And that's what it really takes to respond to these kinds of things. So, thank you very much. And, and I get to finish up. And, and as, as I said, uh, in, in any major disaster, any major event, whether it's natural or, or human-made, uh, public health would have a role in coordinating health activities. Uh, one of the key things we would do is, is around communication. We would need to make sure that, that uh, health care providers know what's going on and what their roles and responsibilities are. We would need to be working with our local health departments to make sure they're doing what needs to be done. And we'd also have to be getting information out to the general public to tell them what is going on and what they should be doing to, to protect the health of themselves and their families. Uh, also, in any kind of major event, there would be limited health resources. That's something we saw even in the floods, that we needed to get some additional, uh, additional health care providers into some limited areas. Uh, consequently, another role that we have is, is to try to coordinate those limited health care resources to make sure people are getting to the right place and that resources are indeed available. And then the third thing that we're responsible for is, is assessing what the resource need is and accessing those resources. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, even in the floods, there was a need for additional resources. Any major event, we would need additional resources, likely federal ones. And all of that work we would be doing through the Oregon Emergency Management System that Myra Lee just described. In the case of bioterrorism, we have uh, other specific functions as well, and that's what I want to focus on the, the rest of my time. And I thought when I was originally preparing these, these comments that I would have to be convincing people why this was important, and I don't think I have to do that now. Uh, but I did want to give a little background. Uh, bioterrorism actually has been around for, for a long time, uh, but just in the recent past, there's some things I thought you might want to know about. In, in 1979, in a Soviet city, there was a release of a dust plume. Uh, that dust plume was, was from a uh, biological weapons plant. It was contaminated with anthrax. 79 people were exposed. 66 of those people died from pulmonary anthrax. In 1984, I think many of you know that there was an attack in the state of Oregon by the Rajneeshi cult. Uh, they put salmonella into salad bars uh, across Wasco County in an attempt to influence an election. No one died from, from that attack, but 750 people were affected. Uh, many of those people uh, were hospitalized. Another thing that we know is that there is state-sponsored biological weapons production, and Iraq, for instance, does have a, a well-known uh, biologics unit, and in fact, they have over, it's estimated they have over 8,000 liters of anthrax spores. And then, of course, I think we all know the events of the last few weeks, and whoever is causing uh, that, that terrorism, uh, at least from my perspective, it clearly is a terrorist attack. Why, why is biological weapons uh, attractive to, to terrorists? Well, well, one is that it's actually relatively easy to acquire biological agents. Uh, up until recently, you could, plague, you could purchase plague and anthrax in the United States, and while you can't do that any longer, you still can do that internationally. Uh, it's not that difficult to grow. You, you need a basic microbiology background, but you can grow most of these pathogens yourself, and all the culture materials that you would need, again, are readily available. For the most part, it's something that, that you can avoid detection, unlike some of the other weapons that people would want to use, and compared to other weapon systems, it's relatively inexpensive. 
there are some downsides to using biological agents. One is that there is a risk to self. If you're dealing with pathogens, it's possible to infect yourself. Another issue, and we'll talk about this more as we go along, is that it does present some delivery problems. When we're talking about bioterrorism, one thing I do like to, to note is that any pathological agent can be used as a bioweapon. And uh, that, I think, was clear from the salmonella that they used in the Roshnisi attack. But when we're talking about bioterrorism, the thing that really strikes terror into the hearts of people are what we consider the, the three big threats, and those are anthrax, plague, and smallpox. And I think many of you have read the papers and listened to the news like I do and are probably very up to date on anthrax, but it has three clinical syndromes. It has a cutaneous or skin infection syndrome that's usually relatively easy to treat. It's when spores get into your skin through a wound or, or a cut or a scrape, infect that. There's a characteristic lesion. Uh, they are easily treated usually by antibiotics unless it's gone on too far. There's a very rare form of intestinal anthrax that you would get from, from eating contaminated foods. And then the third and most deadly form is inhalation anthrax, where you actually inhale enough spores in order to set up a, a basic anthrax pneumonia. Spores, either on your skin or, or uh, breathing them in, spores are the reasons why anthrax is a, uh, a d desirable weapon for, for terrorists. And instead of dying when anthrax runs out of, of nutrients, it instead forms a hard crust over itself, and that spore then can last dormant in the soil or on the surface for, for decades. And then when it finds a favorable environment in the skin or in the lungs, uh, that's when it regerminates and causes the infection. Uh, that makes it a, a much easier to, to deliver uh, organism than virtually anything else, and that's why we've seen anthrax uh, actually being delivered and causing illness through the meal. One disadvantage to, to anthrax for terrorists is that it is non-communicable. Once a person has it, they are not going to spread it to other people, so the terrorist is really limited to the number of people that he or she can get exposed to those spores. And as I mentioned, treatment is available, particularly for the uh, cutaneous form, but can, you can treat pulmonary as well, but oftentimes it is, it is not successful because of the stage the disease is in by the time you recognize it. The second disease I wanted to just mention briefly is, is plague. Bubonic plague, as you know, is the Black Death that <coughs> killed a quarter to a third of the population of Europe in, in the Middle Ages. Um, bubonic plague you get from being bitten by a f infected flea who has been on an infected rodent who then infects you. Uh, it is not a skin infection. The bacteria goes to the lymph nodes where you then develop these big blue-black masses in your lymph nodes uh, that are called buboes, and that's why they call it bubonic plague. Bubonic plague also is not communicable in general, and uh, uh, it also is relatively easily treated with, with antibiotics. But one of the problems with, with plague is that it can go into a systemic infection. It can infect your lungs and give you a uh, plague pneumonia, and at that point you have pneumonic plague. And when you start coughing with pneumonic plague, you have respiratory droplets that can infect other people. That is the real thing that we're concerned about with, with plague, is, is having an outbreak of pneumonic plague. But in order to do that, terrorists would have a real delivery problem. They would have to get aerosolized plague uh, into a group of people to get them infected to start that kind of outbreak. And uh, that's something that's not impossible to do, but that is something that is much harder than, than sending it through the mail. There is treatment, as I mentioned, for, for both pneumonic and bubonic plague, much more effective in, in the, the superficial bubonic uh, stage. There's really no vaccines that, that are useful for the plague, however. And then the third disease is smallpox. There's only one clinical syndrome for, for smallpox. It's, it's a generalized infection that is characterized by a very severe pox-like rash. The advantage to, to terrorists is that it is very communicable. Uh, once, once you infect somebody, they can pass it on either by coughing, through passing along saliva, or even in direct contact. So it is something that is very communicable, and it is deadly. Up to 20% uh, of the people who get smallpox end up dying from it. 
the disadvantage to terrorists, or at least this, the would-be disadvantage to terrorists, is that uh, it shouldn't be available. As I think people know, smallpox was eradicated from the face of the earth in the 1970s and was only kept in laboratories. So it shouldn't even be something we have to consider. But there is a possibility that some of the, those laboratory specimens have leaked out and gotten into the wrong hands, and so it is something that we need to be concerned about. Again, one of the problems with anthrax, again, would be uh, anthrax with smallpox, would be the delivery issue, although I don't think it would be quite the problem that we that would have with, with the plague. Uh, unfortunately, there is no antibiotic treatment for smallpox, and I think you people know from reading the news, too, that there's limited supplies of, of vaccine, and even if there were enough vaccine, that's, I'm not sure we would recommend doing uh, vaccinating the population right now anyway. So, so right now, the, the uh, treatment for trying to maintain or contain a uh, smallpox outbreak would be isolation of the person who was infected, and then isolation and vaccination of those close contacts. So those are the three organisms I just wanted to mention brief, briefly, and then get into, so what is the public health role if one of those things were to happen here in Oregon? Uh, most, most of the time, we like to think of ourselves in public health as the primary prevention people, the people who prevent disease before it ever happens. In this case, that is not our role. Uh, the role of preventing a bio event is with law enforcement, as we've already discussed. Public health really kicks in after that has happened. And we have four roles in dealing with the biological event. The first is identification. And one way we can identify, and using anthrax as an example, would be to actually identify a case, and that's what happened in Florida, is a clinical case uh, specimen from, from that person was sent to their public health laboratory identified as, as anthrax. And we have been working with, with uh, our local health departments, with infectious disease contacts, with hospitals, with local health care providers over the last couple of years to make sure that they're thinking about these things and would be able to identify them. The other way we can identify anthrax, for instance, is by doing an environmental sample. And right now we have growing in the laboratory on culture environmental samples that have been sent to us uh, that were possibly contaminated with anthrax. Nothing has been so far in the state of Oregon. Uh, but we're able to do that now because we have a bioterrorism grant from the Centers for Disease Control that has allowed us to enhance our lab capacity so that we can now uh, identify almost all pathogens that would be used as a biological logical agent. So after we've identified the agent, the second thing we're involved in is investigation. At, at the state level, we have a number of epidemiologists. At the local level, we now have a number of communicable disease contacts, primarily public health nurses, and they are our disease detectives. When, when there is a case or an exposure identified, at that point, they go on site and start looking at what is the most likely source of this and who are those people who are either now infected or at risk of being infected. And again, over the last couple of years, we've really tried to beef up this work through a bioterrorism grant from the Centers for Disease Control. But I also wanted to, to let people know that this is beefing up work that we've already been doing. I mean, this is what our communicable disease people in local health departments do all the time. Usually it's identifying E. coli outbreaks or measles outbreaks or hepatitis A outbreaks. These would be de different organisms that were purposely uh, trying to get people sick, but it's still the same basic work that we've done for years and years. The third piece, then, is containment. We would want to make sure that all those people who are infected get appropriate and aggressive treatment, and all those people who are uh, exposed are getting preventive treatment. We would also work on what other prevention strategies we could put in place to further confine the spread of the disease. And then the fourth specific role we have is one of communications. We need to be able to communicate within the system, and so over the past couple of years we have been working to provide the, the kind of communication infrastructure through computers and from, through telephone lines so that we can communicate out to local health departments and to the health care providers and they can communicate in with us. And then another part of communication that we're finding critically important uh, around these last few weeks is, is just the getting information out to the general public. We have hundreds of calls a day on this issue from the public, from media, from healthcare providers, and providing information is a very, very critical role for us. 
There is a public health system. I've mentioned the word system a number of times. There, there truly is a public health system that has a federal, state, and local component. At the federal level around communicable disease issues, it's the Centers for Disease Control. And they provide us with a, with a lot of consultation. They provide us also with a lot of our funding. And I've mentioned that bioterrorism grant, that's a million dollars a year ongoing for, for, those, for those efforts. They also would be able to provide us on-site support. If we were to have an event here in Oregon, they would send people out to help us. And I think people may have heard that when the first Florida case was found, there were CDC staff on-site in that county within a matter of hours. Another nice program that they have is the National Pharmaceutical Stockpile Program. They are able to get out to local health departments, to, to local areas, uh, mass quantities of uh, antibiotics and vaccines within a 12-hour period. After the federal level, there's the state level. And here, here at the state, we have public health functions within our Department of Human, Human Services. We're actually a relatively small unit. We have just under 500 people. Our role is to coordinate and provide consultation for the entire public health system, and that's working primarily with our local health departments. We do have oversight functions, and we are a funding conduit for the counties. They get about a third of their dollars through, through the state. But where the rubber meets the road with direct services of, of public health needs is at the local health departments. There are local health departments in every county. They do not report to us. They, they serve at the pleasure of their own local board of county commissioners. It's a larger system than, than ours, about 1,200 employees uh, at that side. And as I mentioned, they're the ones that are providing you with your direct services. How are we doing? How are we doing right now, and how would we respond to an attack? Um, I, I truly believe that we in Oregon have a, a very competent, science-based, solid system. I, I think that, and I've said this consistently, if we were to see an attack like we've seen on the East Coast, that, that Oregon's public health system would be able to step up and respond equally as well. I say that for three reasons. One is that, as I mentioned before, it is similar to the work that we're doing, so this is something that we already know how to do. Even with the case of smallpox, uh, I mean, I think that we should remember that this is a disease that we have already eradicated from the world once, and we could do that again. Another reason is because of the Rajneesh attack. Even before we were thinking of bioterrorism, this was, was something that was picked up by the public health system and was able to be contained. And then the third reason is looking at the response in other states and, and uh, Washington, D.C. Seeing what they did in Florida and New York, I think, was real competent response to, to the issue. They've done a good job, and I think that, that our state public health system matches to, to any of those on the East Coast. Another thing uh, is that we are prepared, or at least we're getting prepared that this is something that we haven't just thought about yesterday. This is something that, that we've been working on for at least the last couple of years through our grants. And uh, as Greg mentioned and Myra mentioned, it's been something that we've been working on system-wide for a long time, although not so much focused on terrorism. Also, I think people in the Portland metropolitan area sh should, should be reassured to know that an additional federal grant for the Metropolitan Medical Response System has been coming in over the past couple of years, and that grant is to provide monies for public health, fire, police, emergency medical services, uh, hospitals, fire departments, all to work together around bioterrorism and other terrorism act, anti-terrorism activities. And from what I've seen and from what I've heard reported in the paper, uh, although we haven't had an actual event yet in responding to threats and hoaxes, they are doing extremely well. I can't say that the public health system is perfect. Uh, in fact, we worked with local health departments a, a year or so ago and identified what we thought was about seven and a half million dollar a year shortfall in what we needed to have really good core capacity. So, so, so it is an under-resourced system. Um, and I think that that under-resourcing is particularly seen in smaller rural counties where oftentimes they will have only one nurse and even in some counties really only one main employee for their public health system.
Another thing that I get asked quite often is, are we able to respond to any event? And as I mentioned, I do feel that we're confident to respond to what we've seen so far, uh, but I certainly can think of scenarios that would totally overwhelm us and that would totally overwhelm anybody. And actually, one thing, I, one response of mine to that question is, look what happened with the World Trade Center. I mean, no matter how well any system was able to respond, they weren't going to save those 5,000 people in the building. And they're currently are scenarios you could think of that would be equally devastating in the regards to bioterrorism. And so with that, I think I'll, I'll close my comments and sit down and we'll open it up for questions. I guess I would end, though, just by saying that, that in summary, that law enforcement, again, is responsible for identifying threats and preventing any events. That public health is responsible for the coordination response around all health issues, and we have those specific responsibilities of early detection, investigation, containment, and communication around bioterrorism. And then emergency management is really the glue that holds everything together, coordinating major event response and accessing additional resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. The City Club prides itself in providing timely programs, and we're a bit prescient in this because we asked them several months ago. In fact, uh, Major Wilford was questioning me rather closely on whether or not we had some advanced information. Uh, my, uh, my question has to do with the dissemination of information. It's clear that there is certain information that needs to be withheld, particularly uh, with respect to criminal investigations. But I'm wondering how it's decided what information will be withheld from the media and the public, um, and how it's decided. And I will refer to Attorney General Ashcroft's warning about three weeks ago that there was a serious threat of terrorism that would occur over that particular weekend. But when questioned about what the public should do, the answer was basically be vigilant. Uh, so my question is, again, how and who decides what information should be withheld? I think that question is probably for me. And um, I can at least start the discussion on that one. Um, uh, you know, the. the um, I can, I can start off by saying that um, law enforcement in the state of Oregon, is, there's no information today that would indicate that Oregon is a target of international terrorism. However, law enforcement, based on the events of September 11th, remains vigilant and will continue to remain at high states of vigilance and alertness uh, in the days and weeks and months to come as that investigation continues. Um, there are, um, this investigation is very large. And if there are uh, threats to public safety that become known to law enforcement, um, they will uh, make the appropriate responses. And if the uh, public is, if there's a necessity to respond to an event or prevent an event, that's going to occur. Um, the uh, investigation that's currently going on is, is quite large and it's international in scope and, and um, it involves information um, both in the military and at the federal level that is um, uh, due to the uh, efficiency of the investigation needs to be classified and, and tightly controlled as they, they make their way and, and progress on this very large and complex investigation. Uh, but relative to public safety and, and here at home in Oregon, uh, if information is, is uh, known that involves a threat, then that will be uh, handled appropriately and, and a response by law enforcement, and, including the federal authorities, um, will occur. Well, and, and I would add that, that you know, some, some of this stuff we're still working through. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that's been interesting over the last couple of weeks is, is dealing with, with situations around threats and hoaxes. We're, we're finding out that although we've done planning, there's lots more planning to be done. And actually, one of the issues that we're bringing up today at, at Security Council is the whole thing about developing a, a protocol around, around communication so that it's clear when things should be released to the media and to the public and, and when they should be not and who should be doing that. 
And, and just as an example of, of some things that I think could be a really damaging piece of information is that, is that we have some people that, that are using handheld field tests to, to test for uh, the anthrax bacillus when they're out doing an investigation. Uh, we've had two situations now where, where those have come back positive and then they've come into the lab to be tested and they are negative. I mean, and, and to totally negative. And so to have somebody release information that we have a positive field test would, would create alarm that, that really, really is, is unfounded. Uh, and so it is something that, that I think that we need to, to, to look into and come up with better protocols. There's another aspect related to communication, and that is that there is a tremendous amount of information um, being made available by a variety of sources, um, such as CDC and uh, the um, and FEMA and, and some of the other federal agencies. We are making every effort that we can to make sure that our emergency management network is in place so that the local officials do have the information that they need to work with. And uh, we have expanded our network considerably, so most of the information that we deal with is non-urgent but important information. And when we get it, we pass it immediately on to all of, of our partners at the local level. Greg McPherson, City Club member. Uh, it's, uh, I think, well recognized that the horrific events of September the 11th involved uh, a success of response but a failure of prevention. Uh, and I wanted to focus on what role the um, state law enforcement should play in an event that involves many jurisdictions and, in fact, international uh, prevention efforts. We have saw perpetrators who came from, uh, we believe, outside the United States and moved through a number of jurisdictions. Uh, that involves, obviously, a very sophisticated intelligence uh, kind of system in order to track that kind of movement. What role does state law enforcement play in that process? The role of state law enforcement is to um, help facilitate any, any information that would um, help the investigation uh, that is currently going on is a role that we play and to help. In the new Office of Public Safety and Security, one of the roles that we'll have is to help uh, do just that and to facilitate uh, criminal intelligence operations and also information flow uh, for investigative purposes from the Oregon Department of Justice, uh, criminal justice section, and also uh, uh, with other law enforcement to the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force operations. Hi, my name is Fred Rosenbaum. I'm a city club member. Uh, just on a more humorous side, I wish we'd get through with anthrax and get back to representative conduct on TV. It was a far better situation. But on the more serious side, uh, I lived through the Vanport flood and the Columbus Day flood many other incidents in the state of Oregon, and the Oregon National Guard, Army and Air, played a very, very important part uh, in these situations. Vanport flood, 28,000 housing units floated down the Columbia River. Uh, the Guard presented, uh, prepared housing and transportation and medical supplies and everything else under the sun. I did not hear any of these three people talk about the National Guard. Do they still fit into the picture? And the second question is, who is in overall control of your operation? Do you work as a committee? Do you go through the governor? Who calls the shots? Thank you. On the first point, uh, the National Guard is very much an active part of uh, the emergency preparedness capability within the state of Oregon and in most states. Uh, the way that they are ordinarily activated is that if we get a request from local government that uh, for something that, that the Guard has that cannot be provided by any other means, then the governor will uh, in his declaration of emergency indicate that the guard will be activated and for what purpose uh, it will be activated. And it's generally limited to the situation at hand. Um, they were extremely active in the 1996 floods and they are uh, our partners in, in all of these kinds of activities. Um, we do have um, coordination with them on a daily basis and we have uh, we have them involved in all of our planning efforts at the state level. They work very closely also with local governments, so they are very involved. Um, I'm not sure if I remember the second part. Who's in control? Who's in control is, it depends on the situation, 
And yes, we do work as a team, but it, it's basically under a unified management concept. And it depends on what type of disaster we have. If we have um, something uh, like the flood, then emergency management is generally the primary coordinating agency. But if it is something that's law enforcement, uh, then state police is going to be involved. If it's uh, related to, if it's a massive uh, disruption of the transportation system, then the Department of Trans Transportation is the primary lead agency with the support of state police and the other agencies. So it does depend on uh, what the incident is. But overall, the governor is in charge. And if I could respond to those two, the, the first time I really saw the guard in action was with the floods in, in 1996, and, and I was incredibly impressed. I mean, they, they are able to mobilize a huge amount of resources to do a tremendous number of, of things. So people who don't know the guard really should become more knowledgeable about them, because they are a tremendous resource for, for the people of Oregon. Um, you know, we, we, we talk up here uh, about, you know, the committee we work we do and, and the coordination we do, and when we're not in a disaster, that is the way it works. Uh, but as soon as there is a disaster, and particularly one that's declared, I mean, it basically becomes a, a military operation, and uh, the governor is in charge of things. In general, my release shop, the emergency management would be in charge unless there was a specific reason to have another incident commander. But even in those cases, still, it's the Office of Emergency Management that's coordinating the show. Betsy Warner, City Club member and program committee. And I'd like to bring this right to the neighborhood and office level. When we were first planning this program, we were thinking of things like earthquakes and, and such. And um, I'd like to ask you, um, in regard to earthquakes or any kind of disaster, what leadership do you hope citizens would exert at the local level? And what are you do doing to help prepare our leadership at the local level? The, um, the activities that have occurred in Portland over the years have, have been very extensive. There have been a number of uh, neighborhood types of, of programs that have provided training uh, related a great deal to earthquake. But when we start talking about neighborhoods and uh, what can be done, your closest link to assistance is really your, your city or county emergency management agency. City of Portland and Multnomah County have very good resources and have uh, worked a lot with neighborhood associations uh, to provide the training and uh, information that they need to be prepared. Uh, they do have a website. We do have representatives from the fire department here. And they, in the city of Portland, fire is responsible for the emergency management program. So they're a tremendous resource. And in every county, every county in the state is required to have an emergency management program. Uh, cities may have one, but counties are required to have one. And um, you're fortunate here because you do have two, the city and the county. And there's a very active regional group as well that also provides this assistance. And, and if I could add on to that too, I, I, I mean, I think volunteers are a tremendous resource. And I think it's something that, that we in state government haven't thought as much about it as we as we should, and actually, that's a discussion that's going on right right now. Is is how we in public health can can utilize volunteers more. Uh, on the other hand, I think it is very important that volunteers do what they need to be doing. And for for, for instance, I know in uh, in the New York City disaster on September 11th that that hospitals were actually over flooded with healthcare providers who were going down there trying to help and actually were getting in the way. So it needs to be a coordinated response, but one that we need to think more about. This will be our last question. Bill Savage, member. Uh, Dr. Higginson, could you comment on the uh, credibility of, of nerve gas? As a, is it a credible bioterrorism weapon? Uh, it, it, it is a credible weapon. And I mean, the reason that I say that is because there has been an attack of a, of a chemical agent in, in Tokyo. In the Tokyo subways, sarin gas was, was released and resulted in the deaths of a number of people and the, the, the harm to, to uh, hundreds more and the, the clogging up of the healthcare system by literally thousands of people who were then thought that they had been exposed to a chemical agent. Uh, so, so yes, it is, it is a, a real possibility. Uh, 
I actually think it is more difficult to produce effective chemical weapons uh, than it is to, to produce biological ones. The, the, the science is simpler, simpler growing bugs than it is to, to get a, uh, a chemical weapon. There are also still some delivery problems with, with chemical weapons as, as, as well. You know, it's, it's difficult to get that agent close enough to enough people to really cause the, the kind of destruction that terrorists would be looking for. Well, with that, I should like to thank our panel very much indeed, and we are now adjourned. Thank you.